Defending human rights often demands immense courage, resilience, and an unwavering commitment to justice. And today, we have the privilege of hearing from four remarkable individuals whose stories epitomize the triumph of the human spirit in the face of real adversity. Now, our first speaker needs no introduction. Ennis Cantor Freedom, former NBA player for the Boston Celtics and a relentless human rights activist, has not only excelled on the basketball court, obviously, but has also fearlessly raised his voice against injustice, particularly for the Uyghur population. And our second speaker, one of our heroes, Bill Browder, is himself a giant figure in human rights activism. He's a visionary in finance and human rights advocacy, and his campaign to bring about around the world the historic Magnitsky Act has led to human rights violators being held accountable, often for the very first time. And just a quick aside, Bill was with us probably six or seven years ago talking about Russia and everything. Yeah, no, but no, Russia's not like that anymore. You know, no, that, you know that's, that's what it was like, and we all saw what happened next. So I think a, a good lesson to us all. Um, and then to talk to us from the world of climate activism, please welcome the founding executive director of Force of Nature, a youth nonprofit mobilizing mindsets for climate action, one young world delegate, Clover Hogan, and one of Canada's leading activists campaigning for racial and gender equality, founder of the Forest Girls Foundation, Inc. and WoFam Tech, Femtech, One Young World Ambassador, Aminka Belvit. And to moderate this panel, let's give a huge welcome to a true One Young World hero, Canada's first openly gay Olympian. He won the gold medal for the 100-meter backstroke at the Olympics and was on the cover of Time magazine after he came out as gay. He was ostracized by much of the sporting world, losing his sponsorship deals. And he, after he retired from swimming, he worked with the IOC for several years as an athlete representative, but later became a loud voice in activism, resigning from the organization in 1999 and vowing to fight against its corruption. His transformational efforts led to him being named Canada's chef de mission in 2012 and being appointed Companion of the Order of Canada, the nation's highest civil honor. Please welcome Mark Dukesbury. <laughs> Well, hello everyone, hey. good afternoon. I'm so excited to moderate this panel. Um, we're all activists here and we've stood up for different causes against different organizations or environmental issues or whatever it may be. We might even have fought against opposing issues. It's not about our activism per se today and the issues themselves. It's about how we survive those experiences, how we deal with activism burnout. And I think it's really great to get some of these insights earlier in your activism career. And so without further ado, let's get started. So Bill, I'm going to start with you. Um, at the 2016 Olympics in Rio, I sent a tweet at one in the morning that called a Russian athlete a doper. <laughs> I, and I woke up at 6 a.m. and I had the state of Russia against me. I'm not kidding. Like, I, I had death threats and they'd, they'd closed down my Instagram. And well, welcome that to my world. Yeah, that was one tweet. <laughs> You've been dealing with the Russian government for, like, close to two decades, and, and Putin personally has a vendetta against you. So how do you cope with that sort of tension in your life? Well, you know, it's, um, uh, it's interesting because um, I, I'm, I'm watch like everybody else, I watch this um, war in Ukraine right now. And there's many millions of people sitting in Ukraine um, every night going to bed, not knowing whether they're going to be bombed into oblivion. And a whole country is dealing with that. And so um, I think that what happens, at least for me, is that you kind of um, uh, you kind of get used to it. Um, you know, you can't live in panic and fear. I mean, there are moments of panic and fear, and I've had a lot of them, but you can't live in that, that um, state of mind your whole life and so you kind of you it for me anyways it became sort of a steady state type of thing where um uh you know i was o i'm always on alert but but i'm not i'm not s sort of sitting there you know in panic because i don't think the human body could um sustain that kind of panic totally can you just give us like one example of maybe the lowest moments or one of the scariest moments that you've had in this journey um 
Yeah, so um, in 2018, um, Trump and Putin were meeting for the first time at the Trump, at the Helsinki summit. And, and um, uh, it was just after, it was on a Monday, and it was just after um, Robert Mueller had indicted 12 uh, military intelligence officers from Russia for hacking the election. So they have the summit, they have the press conference, and the, one of the first questions for um, Putin from one of the American journalists is, are you going to hand over these 12 military intelligence officers? And Putin smiled. He had obviously been preparing for this question all weekend. And he said, yes, it's entirely possible that we would. Um, but if we did, we would expect some goodwill and reciprocity from our American friends. And specifically, we would expect them to hand over Bill Browder, me. Wow. Um, and that, Called so that, that, that out. <laughs> but, you know, of the seven some odd billion people in the world, I'm the one name checked in this thing <laughs> against a guy who was to bring me back to kill me. But, but what was, more, I mean, th Putin has hated me for a long time. That wasn't unexpected. What was unexpected was what happened next. Uh, the next journalist asked um, Trump, you know, uh, Mr. President, uh, what do you think about Putin's offer? And without skipping a beat, he said, I think it's an incredible offer. <laughs> and. <laughs> That, that, that was really the terrifying moment. The most powerful man in the free world wanted to hand me over to a dictator who wanted to kill me. Wow. Wow. Ennis, you've been extremely outspoken. Right. You've taken on China, Turkey. Yeah. Um, when I, I spoke out against the IOC, as David said in the intro, and I really thought when I yeah. took that stand, I would turn around and there'd be like hundreds, if not thousands of athletes going, yes! Yeah. And I turned around, I was like, crickets. There was like nobody there. <laughs> and I'm curious. Has your experience been like that? Is it lonely being this outspoken? I mean, it's, it's important to, you know, stand up for what you believe in if it, if it means sacrifice and everything. You know, um, some of the things that I actually talk about is human rights and human rights above politics. So I started to talk about some of the problems that were happening in my home country, Turkey, and also China. And when I the conversation was about Turkey. I had so much support from my teammates, from the NBA, from the players and my coaches, and they gave me so much hope and motivation to fight. But when the conversation was China, mm -hmm. I was talking about the ongoing genocide towards Uyghur people, Tibetans, Hong Kongers, Taiwanese people. So I started to talk about it, and I was like, I was expecting the same you know, support from my teammates, and they're like, listen, man, we love you, we support you, but we just cannot do it out loud. I asked them why. They said, well, we have shoe deals, we have endorsement deals, we want to get another contract. I was like, what are you talking about? They said, more people watched NBA games in China than American population last year. Mm -hmm. So if you say a word about it, you are done. I had a conversation with my agent, and he's like, listen, if you say another word, you're going to lose around 50 to $60 million I was like, okay. I hang up the phone, I start talking about it. Because, thank you. Wow. <laughs> because, because people need to understand, while we were comfortably playing basketball and making millions of dollars in America, on the other side of the world, people were losing their lives, losing their homes, and losing their loved ones. So I was like, you know what, it's an easy decision for me. And also I asked them one simple question. I was like, put yourself in their shoes. If your mother, if your sister, or if your daughter was in those concentration camps getting tortured every day, would you still pick money uh, and business over your morals, values, and principles? They usually turn around and leave the room. So it, it breaks my heart because I have hundreds of teammates, hundreds of coaches throughout my 11 year of NBA career, but when I got kicked out of the NBA for what I believe in, not one of them texted me at that broke my heart. That's the lonely. That's yep. so lonely. But Ennis, I mean, you That's also, so in 2017, Turkey basically made you stateless. So yeah. you, you've lost your state, your home, you've lost your career. Would you do it again? I will. I mean, the, the, the toughest part for me was losing my family because I started to talk about the problem, problems were happening in Turkey and they put my dad in jail. They came to my house, they raided my whole house and they actually, my family had to put a statement out there and said, we are disowning Ennis publicly. Uh, the Turkish government didn't believe that. They put my dad in jail for a while. But um, so just like Bill, you know, my name's on Interpol list. They actually just recently replaced a bounty on my head. So 
but would I do it all over again? Yes, because like I said again, while we are sitting here comfortably, many countries around the world, like Turkey, China, you know, I Iran, Russia, and Venezuela, and Cuba, people are suffering, you know? So I would just, it's, it's very simple. You just have to do an empathy and sympathy. That's the two key words. Yeah, you sure paid the price though. It's incredible. <laughs> Aminka. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> My fellow Canadian panelists. Yes, Canada. Um, so you're fighting for advancement of women, of women of color, especially in the technology sphere. I was at a gender equity conference a couple months ago in Toronto, and one of the panelists just said, I can't believe we're still having this conversation in 2023 about gender equality. How do you not feel the frustration of that sort of remnants of, of that feeling? Yeah, so you definitely feel that. I think there's maybe half of the room identifies as woman. If you identify as a woman, like raise your hand. <laughs> yes, make some noise. <laughs> And I think recently the United Nations put a report that we're not going to achieve gender equality for another hundred years to come. So when you think about that and you think about my lifetime, if you have kids and then if they have kids and they have kids and so forth and so forth, they're going to live in a world where because of their gender, their sex, their orientation, they're not going to have equity. And if you're a person like me, a person visibly of color, a black girl, hashtag black girl magic, you even black girl. <laughs> You even face a double sword. And then, of course, if you have different genders' identity, there's another sword, there's another barrier. So you can go through the world and be mad about, I guess, these cards that you're given and be really overwhelmed that when you go in a room, being in tech, I'm usually always the only woman, woman of color, and you see how I dress today, I have a little flair to myself, <laughs> and you know, so when you're in those spaces, you're always asked to either be quiet, dim your light, or not be included, so what I try to do to just make it spicy is that I make sure that I'm heard, I make sure that I'm seen, and I make sure that if I'm in the room, I'm speaking for other people. If I'm on the stage here, I'm going to speak for other people. So that's the kind of way how I look at it. It's like I am privileged to be able to have these opportunities, so I'm going to use that platform to further my community and those around me. Make sure to be seen, be sure to be heard. Yeah. So. Try to pull some nuggets out, right? That's a great nugget. I, as you were explaining how you show up in the circumstances, there's layers of, of barriers there. So how do you not feel overwhelmed? How do you help yourself sort of get through that? That's true. That's such a really good question. I'm glad we're having this conversation because um, Young One World is about celebrating activists, innovators, world leaders, corporate leaders. And sometimes we don't have the conversation of what it is to put yourself out there, what it is to empty your bank account to start a fund, what it is to maybe pawn your favorite purse so you can kind of help somebody in your community. These are the real struggles that you do as a social impact leader. And sometimes when you put yourself on the line, um, it could be very exhausting. Um, you can also get into spaces where your mental health is affected. So we remember in 2020, we un unfortunately watched how George Floyd was murdered on TV. And so as a black person, we've seen this for years over and over and over again. And watching that with a community for a lot of us was triggering. It was like, here we are again, having conversations that we said before, we're not being heard, we don't have equity. And so for me personally, during that year, I was exhausted because all of a sudden, these corporations that never worked with my foundation were now coming to us to work with the token blackie. They wanted to support black girls. They wanted to have black girls in STEM. And I, as a response, I was working overtime. I was working till 4, 4 a.m. to please these new corporate um, interests so that we could get funding. And it was to a point that I actually was burned out. I didn't know who I was. I didn't, was doing anything for myself. And so what I learned from 2020 is that I need to be able to identify myself as a person. I need to be able to walk into the world without saying I'm an activist. I'm a gender equality. And so what I did is that, and I encourage all of you activists and leaders to do this, you need to incorporate a wellness plan. Mark, your world-class athlete and Ennis, you guys always have a fitness plan, a work plan. Activists, you need to have that in the morning, mm. even before I come to Young One World. I do my meditation, I do my stretches. Unfortunately, I don't always take the bus, but the shuttle, <laughs> I'll take an Uber. But it's so important for me to have that time in the morning to connect with myself because you're going to go into 
into the world and you're going to face so many things and you're going to be expected to give so much energy, right? Like I give off energy. So the way that I deal with that is that I center my wellness, I center my happiness and my joy so that it's separate from the work that I do. So no matter what happens to me as a black woman, et cetera, et cetera, my joy is something that the world can't touch. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> Clover. Uh, talking about having conversations that we've had before, you're in the environmental space and you're sitting around tables with world leaders and Fortune 500 companies. How do you not be cynical when you hear so much talk and you see the state of the world as we know it right now? First off, I want to say I'm so incredibly humbled to be on this stage with these activists. I think the, the courage that each one of you has shown to put yourself in the arena is just incredible and genuinely inspiring. And I, I really look to the people beside me when I am feeling disheartened and disillusioned because it's a reminder of why we keep going. A lot of my work the past 10 years on climate has focused on the mental health implications of the climate crisis and specifically understanding the rise of eco-anxiety, climate anxiety. Now, through our research, we found that 70% of young people around the world are eco-anxious. 56% of young people believe that humanity is doomed. As a generation, we are harboring some pretty difficult emotions when it comes to the climate crisis. And you know, it's relating issues around social justice and, and equity. But I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that these difficult feelings come from the enormity of the crisis when in fact they come from inaction in the face of it, right? Knowing that the science is telling us we can't afford any new oil and gas projects and then Rishi Sunak and the UK government turning around and approving new oil and gas licenses like Rosebank, you know, knowing that in the same period fossil fuel companies made record-breaking profits. In 2022, the five largest oil and gas companies made over $200 billion and actively reversed their climate commitments. It's incredibly difficult to see this backsliding, to know that we're hurtling toward this cliff of climate collapse and to see an utter lack of leadership, an utter failure in leadership. And that is true of policymakers. It's also true of people in business who are more interested in greenwashing and being seen to do the right thing than actually doing the right thing. So yes, uh, I often feel really, really frustrated and incredibly disheartened. And this panel comes at an interesting time because for a moment of vulnerability, I'm feeling like pretty exhausted at the moment and pretty burnt out. And I think I'm feeling prematurely disappointed from COP28, uh, which is coming up next month. Uh, you know, this is our 28th conference on climate where we're gonna see more commitments kind of reversed and kicked down the road. But I think as an activist, you know, having started uh, at the age of 11, I've you know, been in this for a while and I've learned to seek out hope in different places. I no longer put my faith in leaders who again are more interested in kind of short-term politics and optics. I put it in the people like those on this stage today who are doing the work, who are not interested in getting, you know, credit or, um, you know, getting appreciation, recognition for the work, the people who are just getting on with it and getting it done. And I say that as well from such a place of enormous privilege, right? Like I get to be an activist and own that title. And that is not the reality for so many people around the world. I have friends in countries like the Philippines who have lost friends and family um, because they're environmental land defenders. So it's from that place, knowing the influence, the responsibility that I have, that I'm motivated to keep going, um, inspired by the people like yourselves who are just putting in the work. Oh, thanks for sharing and being so vulnerable too. Well, thank you. Bill. Let's, uh, let's flip it. So we talked about sort of the low point before. I think I know what your answer is going to be, but what, what's been the high point of, of this really challenging journey that you've been on against Putin? Well, um, so the, my main uh, task was, it all, well, it all started with the murder of my lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky. Sergei uncovered a, a massive government corruption scheme in Russia. Uh, he, was, uh, he testified against the officials involved, and then he was subsequently arrested by the same officials, uh, put in pretrial detention, uh, tortured for 358 days, and murdered in Russian police custody by eight riot guards with rubber batons. Uh, this was November 16, 2009, and, and I made a vow um, 
to his memory, to his family, and to myself that I was going to put aside everything else I was doing and focus all of my time, resources, and energy going after the people who killed him to make sure they faced justice. And we couldn't get justice in Russia. Um, they circled the wagons completely. And so we said, how do we get justice outside of Russia? And we came up with this idea, which is that Sergei was killed for money, effectively. That he was killed for uncovering a huge financial crime. And the people who got that money don't keep it in Russia. They keep it in, in the West. And so the idea was to freeze their assets and ban their visas. That's called the Magnitsky Act, named after Sergei Magnitsky. And I took this idea to Washington, and um, uh, this was back in the days when there was no pro Russia torture and murder lobby in Washington. And, um, uh, and I got a Democratic senator and a Republican senator, uh, Ben Cardin and John McCain, to come up with a bill called the Magnitsky Act. And, um, uh, and they, they originally put it on the books just for Sergei Magnitsky, and then all these other uh, victims from Russia came forward. And um, they said, you found the Achilles heel of the Putin regime. They, they commit terrible crimes in our country, and then they keep their money abroad. Can you please sanction the people who killed my brother, my, my husband, my wife? My... Wow. And um, after about a dozen of these calls, they, they added 65 words to the Magnitsky Act um, to include all human rights abusers from Russia. All the other victims fanned out across Capitol Hill. And on December 14, 2012, the Magnitsky Act was signed into law. And it became a law which affects all. all... Yeah. Amazing. We love laws. And now it's a global effort. Aminka, we don't have a ton of time, but I'm curious, like a lot of what you have to do is working around systemic barriers. Mm -hmm. Can you give like some, uh, like a tip for, how do you do that? It's like trying to move in a movable power. Mark, you asked me like some a huge, <laughs> huge guy, no. question. <laughs> um, how do you move around systemic barriers? I would say you just have to go straight through it. Um, really, I you, thought that's what you were yeah, going to say. Yeah, you really just have to go through it, straight through it. But I would say put an armor on. Um, like Chloe was saying, there's fatigue. And some people of a spectrum can handle different things and others can't. Um, I grew up in Canada very predominantly, like a uh, non-diverse community. So I feel like that gave me an armor as I go through the world. I'm used to being the one of only, but I would say go through it, but give an armor, um, have your support around you, educate yourself. There's a lot of books that are out of fighting the system. Um, so those are my tips for that. Yeah, and it's okay to take a break every once in a while, right? Like not to constantly be against that pressure, but mm -hmm. to recharge and, and let yourself re-energize. Speaking of which, Clover, how are you going to re-energize yourself before CP28? You know, what do you do to kind of make sure that you're going to arrive to be your best activist? I'm going to take a really, really long nap after this. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, <clears throat> Do you know what? I spend a lot of my work talking about why it's so important that we create space for feelings that we might otherwise think of as bad, right? Like mm. anxiety and anger and despair, when in actual fact these feelings are necessary, right? They're the internal alarm bells that tell us something is fundamentally wrong. They're evidence that we're not, you know, entertaining this kind of cognitive dissonance, um, even as so much in our culture tries to switch us off from the issues of climate and social justice. <laughs> And at the same time, right, while those feelings can kind of wake us up and catalyze us to take action, they're often not the feelings that are going to sustain our activism long term, right? I've seen so many young people leaving the movement because of burnout, because they're frankly exhausted. And so as much as we create space for the anxiety and frustration and sadness, which are so valid, we also have to cultivate the joy and connection and community. And I think we're at risk of like inadvertently recreating the same systems and patterns of oppression um, and injustice if we don't create the space to actually think about, well, what are we working toward, right? And so it's, it's a hard thing, but even when it feels urgent and we, even when it feels overwhelming, you need to really think about how do we nurture the energy that is going to allow a different world to emerge. And for me, that lies in connection with other young people, it lies in connection with other activists, it's spending a limited amount of time in boardrooms <laughs> and with policymakers who frankly want to make me hit my head against a wall. Um, <laughs> so it's surrounding myself with, with my allies, with my community, with the people who I know are also going to take up the baton and step in when I'm too exhausted to keep going. I hope just hearing yourself say this 
this is going to give you some energy for the yeah. next couple of weeks. Yeah, I'm saying it. I'm not necessarily practicing it, you're but going I'm going to listen back on this you're conversation. Going to. Yeah. <laughs> Ennis, um, just a final question to you. This idea of social media as, yes. a, as a powerful platform, also a double-edged sword. It, yeah. it was your tweets about China yeah. that got you banned from the NBA. So just thoughts on that. How do you use social yeah. media when? Um, well, I mean, it, it's good and bad. It's good because, I mean, you, you can use it to educate literally millions of people. It's bad if you're an athlete, if you have a bad game. The first thing you do, you go on social media and you see what people are saying about you. You miss a game winning shot. You do not want to go on Twitter. It puts <laughs> so much pressure on you. But I think it's, it's an amazing tool to educate the next generation because especially if you're an athlete, you have an amazing platform, huge um, a lot of people are uh, following you around the world, so you can just literally just put out there what's more important and what they need to stand up for, even if it means uh, sacrificing everything. So a lot of uh, players out there, you know, using social uh, media to educate their neighborhood, their, their people around them, their family members, their teammates and stuff. It just comes to, you know, uh, just to being brave and just going out there and just speaking the truth. Amazing. You know, uh, you heard in the introduction that I stepped out of all of my roles in the Olympic movement in 1999 in protest to the corruption of the International Olympic Committee at that time, President Juan Antonio Samranch in particular. Um, I fought and pushed and pushed for years and years from the outside, and in 2017, I ran for the board of the Canadian Olympic Committee. I wow. sit now as the vice president. I would have said I would never, ever go back. But at that point in my activist life, it was important to be at the table to help the decisions from the inside. So my final words to you are, never say never. Whatever you're feeling and going through right now, it's a moment in time and it's important. But circumstances might change and be willing to change with them to do what's right for your own self and activism at that particular juncture. Let's have a huge round of applause for our four panelists and all the work that they're doing. Thank you, guys. Thank you.